Welcome back folks. This is a new addition to my vintage test equipment and it's a bit of a history for me. I mean, it's a Heathkit oscilloscope. It's a model IO4205 and I think they date back to the late 1970s. Back in 1980 I picked up um, a model IO4105 which is exactly the same as this except for it's only got the one channel. And uh, I always regretted not spending the extra, I think it was like 60 or $70, which is a lot of money at the time, um, not getting the extra channel. Uh, so I always wanted one of these. Um, well, not always, but for the longest time thereafter, I wanted one of these. There are so many different circumstances that you need to have the two channels, uh, especially when you're comparing input and output and stuff like that. And it just having the single channel scope was, uh, well, it's the decision I made and I had to live with it. But recently I saw one of these, this particular one, which is pretty pristine actually for something of that age, uh, come up for sale on eBay for 40 bucks. And I, I just couldn't let it go. So I, I got it. I don't know if I'm gonna have any real use for it. It's strictly a fulfillment of a nostalgic idea. Uh, but you know, 40 bucks uh, and a little bit for shipping. But uh, it came in almost perfect condition. Now, of course, I, I had to throw it up on the bench. Now, it, it came in the ad, it powers on, may need calibration. So I knew that they had powered it on recently. So I just threw it up on the bench and powered it on myself. And I noticed a few things about it. So right now, we got uh, 2,500 hertz going into it. So we can you see that the horizontal is not too bad. It's kind of lining up. There could be a little bit of tweaking adjustment there. But uh, channel one is definitely looking a lot better than channel two. Channel two is kind of a little knee on the, the rising edge there and on the trailing edge at the bottom. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some capacitors in there that could be adjusted to kind of clean that up. And then if we, if we look at a much higher frequency, like if we go up to one megahertz, we can see a couple of things here. Now putting in 0.5 volts peak to peak, 500 millivolts, you can see that channel one is still maintaining its uh, the correct um, voltage, but uh, channel two is dying rapidly at this point. So it, it bandwidth seems to be suffering quite a bit. Now again, you know, at this frequency, they both look kind of okay. I mean, you're up at one megahertz. It, this is, this tops out at five megahertz. So you, you do expect that maybe you'll get a little bit of uncompensatable uh, changes in the waveform. So when I first had a look at this, I said, oh, well, gee, maybe it just needs a little bit of calibration on the, on the voltage of the second channel. And you know, when you go through the documentation from Heathkit, they basically get you to look at it at 500 hertz, one kilohertz, five kilohertz, and then up to a megahertz. And they don't seem to do much with the frequencies in between. But, so I just tried to have a look at this at 100 kilohertz. Yeah, there we go. So, um, there seems to be a much bigger problem with the second channel than I first assumed. You see that the first channel is looking, is still looking pretty good. And, uh, and that's actually great because the two channels are identical, very same circuitry. So I can basically go through from one channel to the next, take get the schematic, which is rather an imposing piece, and I can check each point along the way. Now, if you look at the, the schematic, you'll see that there's only so far it goes through the horizontal before it gets into switching between the, the two different channels and the, the trigger circuitry and stuff like that. So any of these problems that the, our second channel is having, these have got to be prior to those sections. So we really don't have to restrict our views to uh, basically from the, from the input back to maybe the third stage of amplification. Let me see if I can bring that up on the schematic for you. The schematic is, is, is enormous. So here we are looking at the schematic. Um, these are the two channels here, channel one and channel two, the horizontal or the vertical channels. So we have our attenuator at the beginning the problem could be in there. There's a lot of compensation capacitors in this section. So that could be part of the problem. And then we get into the first stage of amplification here. And then the second stage and the th then we get into the trigger amplifier, which is not going to affect uh, the response at all. And then possibly in here. And then the rest of it is all about switching between the channels here and the chop and the alt. Um, so that's basically it. So I have to compare the channel one and channel two together. 
All the voltages are given, so that's really nice. All the waveforms here that we should be expecting to see are also given. So we're going to have to work our way through that. But I would like to get it working as close as I can to specification. Now there also, I noticed there's a little bit of problem with the um, horizontal as well. Number one, the time base is off just by a fraction. It gets worse, the time base gets shorter. So when you're up around about 0.2 microseconds, it's, it's really off by quite a bit. And then I also noticed that the, the length of the trace is not right. It's a little bit long. Yeah, I can show you that by doing the horizontal positioning here, like there's quite a bit there. It's bit more than usual, especially at, at uh, higher frequencies. So I think there could be some adjustment there. It should be just like one division longer than the width of the screen. Instead, it's maybe about three. So it's, it might just be a short adjustment of here. Like you see here is sweep length, that pot there. So you may just have to adjust that and then adjust some of the timing. But that's basically all I have for you. Other than to, you know, maybe run through some of the basic functionality of it. So all that seems to be pretty good. Like the switches are really good. There's no wiggliness in them. There's no scratchy pots or anything like that. Everything just seems to work. The triggering works as expected. You have AC and DC triggering. You have AC ground and DC inputs. You have plus and minus triggering. You have auto and normal. And all that functionality works the way it's supposed to work. So all the major functionality is intact, is physically in great condition. It just came from Boulder, Colorado, up here to me in Ontario, Canada. And I thought for sure that uh, between Canada Post and the US Postal Service that they'd have a great time playing football with it. But it doesn't look like they did that. It looks like it came through. Nothing seems to be broken. Nothing's rattling around inside. The intensity control works. It seems to have a proper range of, of adjustment. So there's the focus, trigger, Horizontal position, like I said. Now, a couple of other interesting things about it. Let me show you those. Right here on the back, the little sticker that says it was uh, calibrated that July 31st, 2004. So it's been quite a while since this thing has probably been in active service. Whoever whoever had it looked after it really well. There's a little bit of dust and stuff like that on it, and a little scuff mark along here. But uh, I mean, that most of that might clean out. And then on the bottom, this was uh, assembled by one Wayne Gatchett in uh, 2002. So I don't know if this is a new old stock or are they actually still making it then? Yeah, so here's uh, the 1980 Heathkit catalog. Now this is the year I bought mine. Mine was this one over here, the, the single channel one, and it was 200 bucks. This one was built in 2002. Now the, the very last year they were offered, that's over here, was in 1987. So this is the last call for them, $349 for the 4205. Um, and they reduced it back down to 299 for the, the, the final sale on them. So that was it. 1987 to 2002, that kit had been sitting around. That's 15 years, if I'm not mistaken. And that's probably why it's in such great condition, is that it wasn't built back in 1980. It was built in 2002. So let me know in the comments what kind of detail you want me to get into in getting this marvelous 5 megahertz oscilloscope up and running. And we'll do our best to comply. And then it looks like he signed it again when he last did the um, calibration on it a couple of years later. So, yeah. There we go, a little bit of history lesson with it as well. I wonder what Wayne's up to these days. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm gonna do a series of videos on this. The next one, probably uh, have it all apart. We have a look inside, see what kind of a job Wayne did on putting it together. So that's it just today, folks, just an introduction to this. And um, we're gonna have a nice little series of videos, getting this puppy back up and in useful condition again. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.